it, it's really great to be here. So thanks, uh, thanks for coming, and, and it's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience too. Um, so I thought I would start um, by just saying uh, briefly what we get up to up in Cambridge at Microsoft Research. Uh, we have this shiny new building next to the train station up there, and uh, uh, MSR Cambridge is the European arm of Microsoft uh, Research. The main headquarters being over in. Um, in Redmond, which is near, uh, near Seattle and Washington. There are about 200 staff, and we grow by about 100 interns uh, during the course of the year, so um, it gets very lively, especially around the summertime, and uh, the mean age drops too, which is actually kind of nice as well. Um, what our remit is to do basic research, but we also um, uh, invent new technologies, both for the company, for business reasons, and also to try and impact the world at large. Um, there are five main groups in the lab, and my group is called Human Experience and Design. Note our new logo, um, which we're very proud of. Um, our group is also uh, the most multidisciplinary group in the lab, um, and we bring together social science, design, computer science, and engineering. Um, so I'm, I'm a social scientist by background. My background is cognitive science uh, with a bit of human factors engineering thrown in. But we have people in the group that range from political science all the way through to hardware engineering. So it's a really great mix of people. Um, so our mission is to understand and invent new human experiences with technology. Um, and although we're very human facing, the other four groups in the building are deeply technical. And actually that's to our benefit because we get the privilege of working with experts across the whole spectrum of computing. So one of the biggest groups in, in the building is machine learning and perception, and it's a world-leading group in computer vision. And um, the computer vision research has been around for about 40 years. Really, in the last few years, we've seen this huge boom in, in, all, in applications of, of um, all kinds of various sorts, really. So to give you a flavor, um, oh, actually, should I, I'll just say first, those of you who don't know what computer vision is, it's a, a set of... Um, technologies, techniques for computing the shape, appearance, um, categorization of objects and scenes in images and videos. And computer vision we can use to analyze a vast array of existing corpora of uh, images and videos. So anything from fingerprints to handwriting analysis uh, to medical imagery. Some of you might have seen this recent uh, app going around that analyzes and tries to guess the age of people based on their uh, faces. Um, also, we're developing more and more powerful techniques um, for um, doing image analysis in real time. So some of this we can apply to people and faces. So you can see now systems for doing um, face recognition for security, um, reading people's emotions to see how they react to technologies. Um, and body tracking is, a, is another big one. So the um, skeletal segmentation algorithms that um, are used in Connect Gaming uh, came out of our lab, for example. And we're doing a lot of this real-time analysis now for analyzing, um, understanding, seeing, and modeling the, the world um, in real time as well. So um, there's some obvious applications here um, to do with, for example, robot nav navigation or driverless cars. And we're seeing also computer vision and maintenance and inspection and traffic safety and manufacturing and all kinds of different things. So it's really a huge field. Um, I just briefly wanted to say how MSR has been working in this field, and it, it's been work, it's strong in all of these areas actually for, for many years now. So, um, for example, we've done many years of work in image and video editing, and this has to do with um, segmentation of objects, um, removal of them, blending and special effects, and so on. Um, so let me just give you a, a sense of what some of these are like. So. Um, this is a little application called Photosynth, which was put together by Rich Zaliski and his gang in Redmond. Um, and it takes panoramic photos or it takes uh, photo, uh, sets of photos from um, social, um, social sharing sites and stitches them together into panoram panoramic images. Another one that his group has recently done is called Hyperlapse. And this is creating... Um, new kinds of videos from GoPro and uh, sort of helmet uh, mounted videos. So if you, if you speed these up in real time, you get a very jerky sort of thing. But if you do hyperlapse, you get a nice smooth experience. And the way this is done is that um, you trace um, a 3D path through the video. You select uh, camera shots that um, along that path, and then you stitch them back together again. You get rather nice effects um, when you do that. 
And so, so we, we do anything from these sort of um, well, fancier applications through to the um, little feature in PowerPoint that lets you segment um, objects out from the background. So there's a whole range of things in this sort of area. Um, another strand of research has to do with image analysis and understanding. So some of the work in, in this area um, is about segmenting um, objects in, in 3D, um, in 3D rendering. So this is uh, work by Antonio Cremonese up in our lab who has done a lot of work <coughs> trying to um, objectively and accurately measure uh, the objects within 3D volumes such as um, trying to quantify brain tumors in, um, in medical image, images. And then there's a lot of work also um, trying to do more than just segmentation to actually um, look at objects and apply labels to them using machine learning. And um, there are a lot of applications um, and research groups um, now working on that. Uh, more recently, we have a, a group, uh, Larry Zitnick and his team at MSR Redmond are actually trying to do a bit more than that. So they're trying to use deep neural networks and language models to come up with more complicated ways, rich ways of describing uh, what's happening in images. And then finally, the, the third strand of work that, um, that uh, comes out of MSR um, has to do with modeling the world and the people in it. So there have been substantial breakthroughs um, in this using depth cameras. So um, many of you will have tried Connect, and that, um, as I said earlier, that body tracking um, um, uh, stuff comes out of our lab. But more recently, um, with new uh, advances in, in algorithms and in hardware, we can now do much more fine-grained uh, gesture analysis and, and hand tracking. So this is uh, Jamie Shotton and his team. This is actually Jem Keskin who's working on this project. And he's showing how you can do this at a range of distances um, and also in many different kinds of lighting conditions. Um, so this opens up all kinds of new possibilities for the things that you might be able to do. And then, um, yeah, so we turn on the lights on first. And then um, the other uh, area of work where um, we've been making significant breakthroughs is in um, the scanning and modeling of a 3D world. So there's um, an application called Connect Fusion where you can take a Connect camera and now uh, walk into, through a space quite slowly, but in real time it will render um, the space that you're walking in. So this shows, um, I think this is actually Heffer's bookshop in Cambridge. So um, I think it was Sharam walked through with a, ca with a camera. And you can see that um, it's rendering what's happening in, in more or less in real time, which is actually pretty impressive. And it does it indoors and outdoors. And when you do that, you end up with um, a 3D model at the end. I don't know what the people in the bookshop thought was going on, but it must have been interesting to watch. So you end up with a kind of 3D model like this, uh, which is a breakthrough, really. And then finally, you might have heard of HoloLens. I don't know if you've seen the video about this. This also comes out of Microsoft. This is a big team in uh, Redmond that's putting this together, but a lot of the key uh, components for this technology um, actually come out of MSR as well. So I'll just play you the video. What if we could go beyond the screen? Where your digital world is blended with your real world. Now we can. This is the world of holograms. What will they enable us to do? New ways to visualize our work. Okay, so it's a bit of, it's a marketing video, right? But I, I think what's interesting about this is it, it, it's one step beyond something like Google Glass because you're actually doing augmented reality rather than virtual reality. So you're actually mapping things onto the real world. So it's quite a different kind of technology. So, um, so there's huge promise for this technology. And, um, and being at MSR, we're actually in a really good position to try and um, exploit these breakthroughs in the technology and to develop real-world applications. 
But what I want to talk about today is that although there are very substantial technical um, challenges still in this field, there are also really big design challenges. And that's one of the things that, um, that I want to cover in the rest of this talk. So, so why is it that there are so many um, substantial uh, design challenges in this field? Well, what I want to argue is that many of the challenges come from the fact that despite all of the huge technical advances that I've just described, computer systems don't see like humans do. And their capabilities and their capacities are fundamentally different. And further, I go farther than that to argue that actually we don't want to develop computer systems that have human, human capabilities. Rather, what we should be doing is looking to develop systems that augment and support what people already do. So to do this, we need a kind of what I'm going to call symbiotic design. And that is that the, what I'm going to argue is that the goal for us in building these systems is not to build human-like vision systems, but rather to shape the technology to our needs and also to design the technology such that we are capable of shaping our own behavior in response to the system. So that's the argument that I want to develop. But I want to do that by taking you through three case studies. So two of these um, are going to be in the area of uh, medical applications, and the last one is in the, more in the consumer space. And at the end of this, I'm going to come back and reflect on what I think those um, key design uh, lessons are for building systems. So let me start with um, a surgery project. Now, some of you may have heard about this project already, so I'm not going to um, go into too much detail here. But um, this is a project we worked on about three years ago in which we were trying to allow surgeons to navigate through and manipulate data in operating systems when they're scrubbed up. So it's a computer vision system to allow them to do that without actually touching anything uh, because they're scrubbed up and they're sterile. So I'm going to play you a two-minute video which will tell you the story better than I can. So let me say a little bit more about the design process for, for this project. First of all, we had to do quite a bit of work on, on the algorithms for this because we couldn't just use the SDK for, for this system because the SDK was designed for a whole body gaming where you have really big gestures and you, you take into account just the, the whole, whole body in the body tracking system. In the operating theater, you have just the torsos um, showing, and you have people quite tightly packed. And they're all dressed the same as well, which is a bit of a problem. And they, and they have to do gestures within this very restricted um, space. Uh, otherwise, they're not sterile anymore. So actually, that was quite, quite an advantage, because what it meant is that we could work very closely with the machine learning um, developer on this project to develop algorithms and a gesture set such that the gestures that we developed could be very e easily distinguishable by the system. So it was important that the machine learning could categorize the difference between one, one kind of gesture and another. Also, 
we, we needed to come up with gestures where there wasn't too much variability for any one kind of gesture. So we had to abandon waving, for example, because we found out that each consultant uh, came in and tried the system waved in a different way. So we got, we got rid of um, that as a, as a key gesture. So we worked with the, with the technologists on that side of it, but also we had to obviously take the user, uh, user needs into account here as well. So one of the constraints and, and one of the requirements was uh, to try and come up with a gesture set that was very easily learnable. So in this case, we used gestural analogs for physical manipulations for looking through the data. So we had, um, we had a, a pan um, gesture, we had a rotate gesture, and we had a zooming gesture, very much like you get on a touch interface. And that worked pretty well. We also had to pay attention to when you wanted to have a one-handed versus a two-handed gesture. For, so for the very frequent kinds of gestures, we um, had one-handed interactions because the surgeon might be holding onto a catheter, for example, so you had to let them do that. Um, and we had to worry about engagement and disengagement of the system. So uh, surgical teams gesture all the time when they're talking to each other or the, when they're actually uh, working with a patient. And what you didn't want to have happen is for the data to go flying all over the place. So we had a control mode. Uh, which was um, invoked by, by voice in this case. So we had the surgeon would say control, um, and then the screen would turn uh, green, and then they, he knew that any of the gestures that he did would now start to manipulate the data. So that was really important too. So we found actually for uh, efficiency purposes, the physical manipulations, the gesture-based uh, interaction was good for anything to do with navigation or continuous control. And when there was anything discrete like a mode switch, voice worked really well. So basically what we found ourselves doing is um, on the aims of the design on the input side were to make the input intelligible to the system, make it efficient, easily learned, and sensitive to the ongoing interaction in the surgical um, team. Now designing the, in the output was, a, was a, um, also a different set of requirements here. We spent a fair amount of time making sure that we had really good, clear output so that the uh, surgical team knew how the system was interpreting their gestures. So we, this was a, um, we had a set of icons, that was the icon for rotate, so that the system was actually saying, yeah, that's what the, um, the system thinks you're doing, that you're trying to rotate the data. And we also had other icons like a, a lock screen icon. But the thing that turned out to be the most useful actually was this little um, feedback screen in the lower left-hand corner of the, uh, of the screen. And actually that was there originally for debugging purposes, but it turned out we, we left that in because it was probably the most important thing that we, had, we put in the interface. And the reason for this is, is as follows. Um, so here's a really nice example where the um, consultant's trying to do a panning uh, move on the, uh, on the data. But as you can see, the skeletal uh, tracking algorithms have interpreted um, the arm of the person behind the consultant as the arm of the surgeon. So what he wants to have happen is actually not happening. Um, and this was used over and over again by the team to figure out what, what the system was seeing and how the um, skeletal tracking algorithm was interpreting the input within, the, within that visual field. So this was probably the most important thing that we put into that interface. So there were lots of lessons we learned from both this, how, how you design the input to get it right um, in the first place going into the system and how you design the system response once you have that input. We used a lot of this learning um, in, in um, the next project that we worked on. This is actually still an ongoing project, but this one's called SSMS. And in this project, um, rather than looking at new interaction paradigms, what we're doing here is now trying to use a depth camera to assess um, people who have multiple sclerosis and to look uh, to see whether or not we can more accurately um, assess the progression of the disease um, as uh, made evident through their motor symptoms. So this is a collaborative um, effort uh, with um, the Human Experience Design Group and the Machine Learning Group um, at our lab and with Novartis, which is this big pharma company which is based in Basel in Switzerland and uh, three uh, hospital clini clinics both in Basel and in Amsterdam. And Novartis's main interest here is really um, doing this kind of assessment, more accurate assessment, in order to do drug testing. Um, so they want it as, as a way of making uh, faster and better, better clinical, um, clinical trials on drug treatments. We were mainly interested in it from a kind of research point of view, both on, on the user side and also on machine learning and design side. And the clinicians were interested in this as a way of uh, treating, um, getting better treatment for their patients. Just had a weird window come up here. Um, 
So let me just say um, a little bit about multiple sclerosis. It's a, it's a chronic inflammatory disease of central nervous system, and you get all kinds of um, cognitive issues with this and cognitive de decline, but you also get um, lots of motor symptoms. So one of the um, kind of key signatures is something called intention tremor. So uh, this is called the finger to nose test. And you'll see that this patient has a tremor as they approach their intended target. And that's called intention tremor. You also get um, problems in gait uh, and problems with balance. So here's a patient on the right hand side who has to walk with sticks. So these are the kinds of things that you would typically see um, this is actually pictured through a depth camera in this case. And currently, the way that uh, a clinician, a neurologist, would assess MS is to use a form like this, which is called the EDSS. And there's a whole bunch of different standardized, uh, standardized tests that they would get patients to do, such as a finger-to-nose test. And they would assign um, a number from zero to four based on their assessment of how bad the person was on each of those tests. And then that then gives an aggregated, integrated scale, which gives you um, some sense of where somebody is on the d disease progression scale. And this is very good for actually structuring the, the examination, and it gives you a kind of overall sense of where a patient is, but it's very inaccurate. So, you know, one, one doctor's rating will be much different from another, and, th and these ratings will change over time. And what that means if you're doing things like clinical trials is you need lots and lots of patients to come in in order to get the power that you need in the test. So our aim then was to, um, was to develop a system using a depth camera instead to try and get um, a more accurate, ob objective assessment of disease progression um, in motor symptoms. And so the system we've been developing has a number of different components. Uh, we've been mainly working at, um, on the far left, um, trying to build a prototype system to capture high quality data from both healthy volunteers and from patients in order to do machine learning on the depth camera images. Um, the machine learning guys have been working on both pre-processing of those depth videos to do things like um, uh, segment out the patient from the background, um, to do some unsupervised machine learning to learn what they call 3D uh, motion sign signatures, and then to train that data using classified machine learning using the ratings of neurologists. And then finally, the, the last step is the visualization of the output of the results. Um, so let me talk about the development of the prototype, because it's actually, this was a very long and complex undertaking. We started with um, doing some observations of how clinicians currently do these um, examinations. And then we did um, three different versions of the prototype, iterating with the clinicians, with patients, uh, with the machine learning folks, um, and testing it in different uh, real situations, and then we did a summative evaluation of the final prototype with, I think it was five clinicians and about 60 patients in the end. Um, so it was a pretty um, long, drawn-out process. But let me summarize some of the key issues uh, that came out of designing this computer vision system. So one of the first things that you, you see when you watch one of these um, examinations is that there's a lot of variability in how people do the movements, even though they're supposed to be standardized. So if, um, if a patient is doing uh, what's called an ataxia um, test, they might start the finger-to-nose, and they, they do the finger-to-nose next, they might start the finger-to-nose test this way. Whereas if, if they're doing it one that their arms are at the side, they'll start it out to the side. And to a clinician, it doesn't really matter because they can assess the, the tremor in the same way. But to a machine learning system, to a computer vision system, that looks quite different. And even when you have um, healthy patients doing, doing things in a very standardized way, these are four healthy volunteers now doing the finger-to-nose test uh, in three repetitions. What you see is that there's a lot of variation in both the um, timing of the motion and in the, in the kind of spatial execution of that motion. So this is all legitimate vari variation in a clinical setting. Um, it's what you would expect, but it's a problem for computer vision systems that are trying to, um, to standardize um, and to make sense of what's happening. Because note that the main job of a computer vision system in this uh, situation is to try and extract the variation that's due to the disease from the variation that's due to everything else. So the more everything else you have, the more of a problem it is. So standardization of movement is therefore crucial to the success of a machine learning system like this. So our main approach here was to, set, was to create a set of instructional videos that the um, patient sees before they do a movement. Um, and uh, the, we worked hard to get these right with the, with the clinical 
team and also with the patients to ensure that they understood what was going on. Um, but it turned out another really important aspect of building this whole interface was to build this in a very flexible way. So a lot of the neurologists who used it in the early versions of the prototype really hated to be kind of locked into a workflow. They felt like the system was like another person that was there taking over from them. And they wanted much more flexibility in terms of being able to skip over movements, repeat them, delete them, um, and more pauses so that they could actually get in there and explain what was going on. Um, actually, the nurses didn't have such a problem with that, but the neurologists really did. Another big issue for the computer vision system is managing the camera view uh, for people. So what you see in a normal um, assessment is that the clinician will often, often go up to the patient and show them how to do the movement, or they might have to support them if that person's really unstable. And of course, that's a problem, right, for the, for the view of the camera. It's a problem for the computer vision system. So what we did in this case was we, we had a different view for the patient and a, and a different view that the clinician was looking at. And we attached the tablet to the back of the system. This is a system here on wheels. And that encouraged the, person, the clinician to stand back behind the um, system when the patient was being assessed. Um, it was flexible, so they could pull it out and rotate it around if they wanted. They also had little remote controls, so if they needed to be next to the patient, they could do that. Um, so another issue we had here, it was a positioning. So um, a lot of the time, a patient would be positioned in front of the camera, and they would stretch their arms out, and their hands would disappear from view of the camera, or they would be slightly off-center. So what we did here was to have a positioning screen, which um, is, uh, appears on the system just after the assessment starts, and it guides the clinician in making sure that the patient is in an optimal position. And also, um, the fact that the trolley is on wheels is used to do that adjustment. So sometimes you can't move the patient because the patient can't move very well, so you move the system instead. So the, the system being mobile was really important here. Another problem was clutter in the environment. And so this is, this is an interesting one because actually if you look at the view of the depth camera, uh, the connect depth camera can't get data from shiny objects. So what we have here is a shiny chair in the, back of, uh, in the background and that gets in the way of segmenting the patient from the background. And yet to a human observer, that, that chair doesn't necessarily stand out from any of the other clutter that's in the environment. In fact, there's lots of clutter in the environment in, in these clinical uh, rooms. Um, and and easy, even like a handbag, so if a, a patient sits down and puts their handbag next to them, that can cause problems for the data. So in this case, we had a, um, a different screen where we did a room, room preparation, preparation phase in which they had to see how the camera sees in order to uh, remove all that stuff that might be a problem for the, for the data. And in fact, what we found really in the long term, I don't know if you can see this very well, but on the top right-hand corner of the clinician screen, we always had the depth camera view there so that you could, the clinician could always check to see what the camera was viewing um, and sort of confirm that. And the other thing that was really important, just as an aside, was the view that the patient was seeing was always displayed on the left-hand side because don't forget, sometimes the clinician is standing behind the device. So they need to confirm what it is that the patient is looking at at any one point in time. So the prototype that we developed is actually um, much better than the original one that was put together and is actually, uh, and, and collected much better quality data um, than we, um, even that, that we had expected for, for training the machine learning. And the um, output of the machine learning now is, is really quite good. We're getting some really promising results for classifying the disease progression. We're now at a tricky phase though, and the, f and the phase, the point that we're at is trying to design the output of the system. And actually, this is a much more complex undertaking than you might think. So um, it turns out that the key here is that you have to make the output of the machine learning system both reflect the basis on which the machine is doing that judgment, but also have to map to the clinician's judgment about what they think is going on for a particular patient. Because if you don't do that, if you don't make that connection, clinicians will simply not trust the judgment, okay? So for example, here's two representations, and the top one we have what's called uh, spatial temporal cubes, which is basically a heat map showing what the machine learning algorithm thinks are the most significant parts of the video for making its decisions in its decision tree. And actually, clinicians really hate this because they look at it and say, 
how can those light, so it's the, the lighter areas are the kind of significant areas for the machine learning. Say, so how can they be important when some of them are even off the body? It makes no sense to them whatsoever. And yet this is how the decision tree is operating. And yet they like the more abstract one at the bottom. And what this is is what's called the slit scan uh, analysis, which is basically projecting onto the y-axis um, over time and showing over time um, the, the movement of any point in the depth of the video. Um, and, and what you're seeing here is actually the tremor as either the right or the left hand approaches the nose. And so what you see here is that in the, in the case of the top um, uh, representation, the right hand has much more tremor in terms of the amplitude of the movement and the repetition of the, that, well, actually that's reflected in the repetition five times, but the amplitude is much bigger than the one on the left hand. Now that they get, okay? But it's actually not as good a representation as the top one in reflecting what the machine learning is doing. So this is a tricky problem, and it's an area in which we're um, still working and we're trying to, um, I think the lesson that comes from this is that you have to provide the context for the output of the system, but you have to, you don't necessarily have to explain exactly how the algorithm got to the point that it is. Right, so let me just um, sum up these two um, cases of the medical work. And I've shown you two examples, one in which we're using computer vision for uh, new interaction paradigms, and another in which we're trying to use computer vision to uh, quantify um, the, an underlying disease. Um, so first it shows that we, you know, computer vi vision systems and interactions need to be shaped with sensitivity to technical needs, to users' needs, and to clinical work practices. Um, but it shows that the truth is that whenever you put a system into an existing um, uh, context, you're going to get changes and adaptations to those working practices. You should expect that. But in order for that to happen successfully, you have to do quite a bit of work sometimes up front to make sure that your gestures and your body movements are intelligible to the system in the first place. Because computer vision systems see in different ways that we do, right? So you need to work carefully with um, technical folks to make sure that happens. Likewise, if you want users to adapt to the system, the system itself needs to be made intelligible to the users. It needs to be self-revealing at very many levels to help the user understand what the system sees. So I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Right, so the last um, area that I want to turn to is that of consumer apps. So you might think that everything I've talked about so far is fine for the kind of medical stuff, but how does it matter to other kinds of um, development work that we might do? Well, it turns out that the kinds of lessons we learned in the medical um, area um, actually do have some really useful application when we look at things like designing consumer applications. And one of the things we've been doing um, lately in the group is trying to come up with new computer vision um, applications uh, for consumers. So it helps not only to design better consumer apps than we claim, but also gives us um, uh, new design ideas. So we've recently been ex exploring a set of ideas for adding computer vision to apps that establish a kind of dialogue between users and a system and which add uh, smart services to visual input. So one of the research prototypes we've been working on, we're actually building at the moment, so I can't fully uh, show you the full working thing, but let me give you a sense of what the scenario is. So we started with a, a kind of scenario um, like this. So imagine this is Jane, she's bought a new house and she wants to buy furniture for her house and she wants to buy plants for her house. Um, and she has a, a new app uh, which allows her to collect up um, objects from the physical world. So she might be wandering around um, and sees uh, plants in a garden that she'd really like for her own garden. She might be wandering through the botanic gardens in a public space and she'd like to collect those. Or she might see furniture in a shop window or in somebody else's home. Um, and so what this app allows you to do is to um, take a picture of that object and segment it out. So this is using computer vision now to do that segmentation. And then machine learning might do some kind of analysis on that object and tag it automatically with, with some kind of metadata. It might actually say, well, this is an antique chair. And that can then help you automatically put it into some kind of scrapbook that you might have. So you also might use voice input now and say, add this chair to my lounge scrapbook or add this plant to my garden scrapbook. And you could, you could also tag it with voice. So that's the idea. Um, and then when she gets back home, she can have a look at all of these scrapbooks that she's, um, she's been building over time. And then at this point, lots of metadata might be added into the application at the back end. 
And she might be able to do other things like, you know, buy the chair. It might show her where we could buy the chair. It might give her more information on the plants that she had gathered and so on. And there are many ways in which you can see this application being used, right? So it could be anything from, we had one guy in a focus group was a heating engineer. He said, I just want to take pictures of all the boilers I've been working on, put them all in there with little notes about how I fixed them. Um, we had another person say, I'd like to take pictures of all my kids' artwork and put that all in a kind of scrapbook and archive. Um, and then um, another woman was doing uh, sculpture night class, and she said, whenever I come across an interesting sculpture, I'd like to add that into, into my, um, my scrapbook. So we think that there's um, possibility of some really interesting ways that people will use this. And this is, is not like Pinterest. So we want to get away from the idea that we're kind of collecting up a whole set of images here. Um, and rather think about collecting objects, not images. So segmentation is part of that story, right? It pops objects out and kind of lays them out in a kind of more of an object way. So we have a little, um, we have part of the app is working. Um, we have a, a kind of um, segmentation experience working. This is just a demo, not, not the actual thing. But the idea is that you would take a, you take a picture of something, it would pop it out. Um, and then you can kind of tweak it with your finger if the segmentation isn't quite what you want. So again, it's using, it's this partnership that you have between people and machine where the um, machine will get, make a best guess about what your object is and then you can go in and, and fiddle with it. Another thing, oh, so th this is something that um, our designer did. He, he used the app to take pictures of all the things in his, um, in his backpack. And you get even quite a nice experience on, on the mobile phone, um, although we're hoping that in the, in the, on a laptop it'll be a much richer experience. And the other thing that this app will do, of course, is do the tagging that I just talked about. So here's a soy sauce bottle, and here's actually what the tagging comes up with. It comes up with soy sauce, which is kind of cool, but it also has whiskey jug and bottle cap. And, and actually, it turns out when people start using this, they really like to see what the machine learning tags things as in the real world. Um, uh, the developer of the app actually did lots of scrunched up bits of paper and was seeing what it would come up with. And he did one all kind of spiraled up and it came up with hermit crab and he thought, he thought that was kind of cool. So there's something about the surprise element in this too. And um, it actually isn't a problem that machine learning algorithms get this wrong if you design the application right, because actually it's kind of fun. So um, as we build this app, um, we're, we're using our learnings from the medical world to make sure that we're establishing a kind of dialogue between the user and the machine, where they can get in and tweak the things that they don't think are quite right. But the interesting part of this, of course, is in the tweaking, in fixing a segmentation or adding new tags in or dismissing tags, the machine learning system can learn too. So we, we have this nice kind of um, symbiotic relationship again. So as a final example, we've also been using um, this thinking about partnership and about intelligence to, as inspiration for new kinds of computer vision games that we might do. So um, I'm going to show you one of them uh, now. Um, this is just a, a concept video. It's not something we've actually built yet. Um, does everybody know what Top Trumps is? Those of you with probably have kids probably know what it is. So Top Trumps is a, is a children's game um, using decks of physical decks of cards. And you might have one on dinosaurs, for example, and you, you would turn over the T-Rex, um, and it would have all kinds of different characteristics. So it might have ferocity of 10, um, size of 9, um, all the dimensions. And then you'd play against somebody and say, I'm going to play my T-Rex, and I'm going to play it on ferocity. And they would turn over a card, and if ferocity, their ferocity score beats yours, they get your card, and vice versa. It's very simple, but a very popular game, actually. So we thought about, um, well, what if you did a kind of computer vision um, version of this? And so in this case, we're, uh, this is all digital, it's on your phone. So you select the Lord of the Rings one in this case. And you would start with, let's say you start with a deck of cards. And you find a friend, and you um, take a picture of the friend to see what uh, you get the best match for. This is Tim in our group, and he turns out he looks a lot like Gollum. <laughs> now, notice that his match is only 27%, right? So then you say to Tim, can you act a bit more like Gollum? So he does more of a Gollum thing, and he gets a much higher match at the top. <laughs> he gets 78%. So he goes into your deck. He's sort of morphed between Tim and Gollum. 
Or you can go to the characters that you're trying to collect and say, and find a friend. So you select a card and then find a friend who looks like that character. Now it turns out we have somebody in our group who looks a lot like Frodo. So we select Frodo, and there he is. So that's David. And uh, likewise, Bob's saying to him, can you, can you pose a bit more like Frodo? So he says, sure. So when he does that, he gets a much higher match. So David, David goes into the collection. And over time, you collect a whole bunch of these uh, folks up based on people you know. And you may recognize some of those people in the deck. And then when you've got a really strong, powerful deck, because you've, you've played with machine learning algorithms, you then play against uh, somebody else who, who also has a deck. Um, and just like with the paper cards, you would uh, play a card, um, like your golem card. You, you pick a dimension, like in this case, character, I think. And the person you're playing against and plays their card and they win, or the person with the strong. So you can see what's happening here. We're kind of making a feature out of the fact that machine learning doesn't always get things right. Right, so let me wrap up by um, reflecting on, I, I've, I've thrown a lot of different examples at you, so I want to try now pull it all together with what I'm trying to say about computer vision systems. So the first thing I'm trying to say is that the goal here should not be to create systems that see as people do but rather to develop systems that process the visual world in a different way. And this could be by enabling new forms of interaction. It could be by through quantifying the visual world in a new way, by segmenting and classifying input for, th for the purpose of uh, any range of tasks, or even just playing games like I just showed you. Um, but the other thing that I'm hoping I'm getting across is that designing these systems effectively is actually kind of tricky. So two major lessons that we've learned out of this are uh, first of all, lots, sometimes lots of work has to be done up front in terms of making sure the input is optimal for the system. You know, so we, I, I talked about how you might have to design a very distinct gesture set or you might have to work on standardized movements uh, in order to make the system, uh, uh, make the input optimal for the system. And that might mean working very closely with the technical teams um, to understand what kinds of visual input is best and how the algorithms work. Second, um, and, and more than this, if, if the systems themselves are intelligible to users, then users can shape their behaviors in order that the input is better for them. Uh, and at the same time, by doing that, by understanding the interaction between their behavior and the system, they can also achieve their goals better. So how do you do this? Well, really what I've shown is that you need to make systems intelligible to users at many different levels. They need to understand how a computer system sees at, very, at many different levels. And this depends on design, uh, design good feedback into the system. So let me go through this little framework. So at the very lowest level, we need to be able to support people's understanding of what the vision system can see, what's it, ca what's it capable of sensing in the first place. So cameras have different fields of view than humans do. They have different um, acuity and, and sensitivity. Um, that fundamentally shape the operation of the system. And we saw, it, so the, here's an example of the surgery case where that little feedback window is used by the uh, team in order to see what's in the field of view, get within view of the camera, and optimally position themselves uh, for the system. At the next level up, um, users need to understand that even when the vision system is positioned to capture the relevant data, it may perceive forms and patterns quite differently from the way that people do. Okay, so in the SMS example here, we saw that shiny objects might not be that significant to us as human observers, but they, have a, they create a real problem for the, uh, for the depth analysis. Okay, and so what we learned in that, in that case is that putting some feedback into the system so that users can understand what those differences are is really important. When we think about recognition, uh, both, both humans and systems are wired to recognize higher level constructs such as objects and behaviors in the scene. However, hum, human interpre interpretation is far more flexible and adaptable um, than current vision systems are, which tend to be much more rule-based and wired in. Um, and it turns out that machine learning systems sometimes get this wrong. So in the case of the soy sauce bottle, it got, it got it right on in, in one aspect, 
um, but it made some wrong guesses in another. And that actually doesn't have to be a problem if you recognize that and if you allow users to, um, to create a dialogue where they can easily dismiss things that, it, that the system gets wrong. And finally, users need to understand how the system acts in response to the interpretation uh, that the system is making. And if they do that, then they themselves um, can then shape their response uh, in, in turn. And so you get this very nice kind of dialogic uh, interaction going on. So as we showed in the top trumps example, once you learn that, you can start to play with the system in a way that makes sense. And you can start to, um, you can start to work with the system to get the response that you want out of it. So let me just conclude then, because I think that what I'm trying to say here is not just about computer vision systems. Really what I'm trying to say here that these lessons are more important in a more general way. And I think we should apl be applying this line of reasoning not just to computer vision systems, but more generally to any system which uses uh, machine intelligence. And one of the reasons I think this message is important right now is that we're seeing a real rebirth of AI. We're seeing AI systems talked about more and more, robots, you name it. Uh, AI has, is undergoing a kind of renaissance. Um, but everything points to the fact that um, you know, people aren't necessarily, I don't think, looking for technologies which do what they do. I think they're looking for systems which augment and enrich what we do in different ways. And the, and the problem is that with deep neural networks and ever-increasing complexity inside black boxes, this is getting harder and harder for us to understand. And so I think um, it's more important than ever that we need to design for what I'm calling symbiotic interaction here, where we really make systems more intelligible to people and we make, and thereby, people can shape their behaviors in order to be more intelligible to systems. And with that, I'm gonna close. Thanks. The 3D, you mean the connect fusion? Polarize the light. Polarize the camera. Or the depth camera. So the depth cameras. Yeah. yeah depth ca so the connect depth camera uses infrared. It, it, it projects infrared onto the objects in, in the scene. And that's how it does its depth sensing. Uh, yeah. So it's not really a kind of polarized one. Uh, I don't think so. I could be wrong about that. I think it's mainly infrared. But somebody may know better than I do. No, no, I hear what you're saying. I'm not trying to say that we don't want to be inspired by what humans do. In fact, our deep neural networks are an attempt to un use an understanding of the human perceptual system in order to think about how we might build better systems. I think that that's right, and that's um, opening up huge technical breakthroughs. What I am trying to say is that ultimately, people will tolerate and, in fact, be drawn to a certain amount of magic but if something is totally magic, magical and in, unintelligible, I think ultimately um, it's very hard for them to use systems. Um, you know, so I, th there are lots of, for example, scientific systems out there now um, where that process statistical data and you put input in and something comes out the other end and scientists are saying, whoa, I don't understand really what's going on inside that system. That's what I'm saying, um, but it's, it's a point well taken.
probably match him as a you know neurologist to look at. So he could presumably be gone if they if they put the second test that you're saying that Reed was evaluated. Yeah. For in March, or in yeah. March, since the was yeah. and are simply. Yeah, it's a really it's a really um, good point. So we tried that um, with cl with clinicians, and it turns out that. The, the clinical cl community has, has a gold standard. They have tests that they've been doing for decades. Um, and if you go and change them, it's, it's difficult. Um, like, for example, um, gait analysis. Anything walking towards a depth camera is very difficult because uh, depth cameras are le much less sensitive in that axis than they are from lateral movements. And yet gait analysis is a fundamental part of how you assess somebody with MS. We also came up with other tasks um, that were uh, meant to be more like daily activities like drinking out of a cup. And some neurologists will, will argue that they're much more important kinds of tests than finger to nose because they say something much more about what you can do. So um, we are trying to edge towards that. But you, with a clinical community, you really have to start with what they will accept. Um, so we can't look at all the movements here. We can only look at some of the ones that they normally do because some of them are just entirely unsuitable for, 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 for the kinds of computer vision system we're talking about. So it's a, it's a difficult problem, but it's a good point, yeah. You talked about some uh, examples of the uncertainty in your results when you're yeah. looking at the users in a, the consumer application. I was wondering if you had any insight in terms of how to present uncertainty to clinicians who are really used to having cut and dry mm. Yeah, that's what we're working on now, actually. Um, and you're right, clinicians, well, I don't think that they believe these decisions are cut and dry. I think they like to project, uh, often project a sense of certainty because that's part of their job uh, in, a, in, a, in a patient situation. So I think they are usually ac accepting of that. But what they really want is a system to support the judgments that they are making rather than one that's going to take over. And so we need to be really careful about how we provide data so that they, um, they feel more certain, more informed. Uh, but at the same time, we don't overstate the case as to what machine learning is actually doing. That, that's a challenge, and we, we haven't got there yet. I think it's actually the trickiest part of it. I mean, what would constitute success in the end? Yeah, and, and the design process seem like it has been brought to the conclusion. Yeah, I, d I uh. really Yeah, I, I, I think that, I, th I think one indication that you're getting it right is that users do feel like they're in a kind of dialogue with the system. I mean, that's what we get with touch-based interfaces. They kind of know, they know what actions are possible and what response they should get. They also know that this system will do a fair amount of work for them and what kind of work that will be. You know, so magic does happen, but it's controlled magic. It's magic that you can expect. So I, I don't know if there's some sort of destination that you reach when you say your design is really compelling, but I think that it, it, it's rather a kind of characteristic of the interaction that you look for.
I think it can be a help sometimes. So it reminds me of some of the um, video work that was done with, um, do you remember Gesture Man? There was a little robot that um, you could control at a distance and people actually started to believe that th that thing had a life of its own. And actually that was really useful in the interaction because you could now start to address yourself to the camera in a way that made sense. So, so I think sometimes anthropomorphizing is a, is a good idea. But I, I see it as just another um, example of how we create theories about what, not just what systems are doing or, th or thinking, but what maybe what the designers had in mind too, which I, I'm not, and I'm not sure, well, that might be useful too in some instances. I, I, I'm not really sure, I haven't really thought about that. But it's good, yeah. Hi. I was just going back to the whole original sequence here, the, the so-called expanded tree. And um, I would say, in the medical sector, there are very secluded and sounded in Poland and in the US, mm -hmm. but this technology is bringing new possibilities mm -hmm. and probably is breaking the standard too. Yes. And I, I wonder if on one side, uh, simply speaking, we need to start more dense, the, the, the need uh, was to start on the same way of the, the, the community class. But is there a space to, at the same time as you provide those tools, that would provide uh, more open tools where they can explore. Uh, and that means understanding what the machine learning can do, understanding what you can do. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah. Otherwise, you don't break those rules. Yes. And remain just in that yeah. box but with the yeah. numbers instead of rigidly. We, ha we have to very much ease into it, I think. Um, so there was nice work by Helena Mentis and others where they, they, were get, they were using, I think, hand tracking. I forget, it was Parkinson's, I think. And the output of the um, hand tracking data they used to generate a discussion between somebody who had Parkinson's and their carer and their clinician. And so it didn't kind of supersede anything that was going on. It became a new, new basis on which they could discuss things. That's kind of, kind of interesting work. No, I think they probably, that's sort of in my background, coming from UCSD, it'd be hard not to kind of um, be part of the story. Um, yeah, I, I think the whole distributed cognition framework argument perspective um, really places an emphasis on artifacts and the environment and how you build on that and rely on that scaffold on that. And I think, yeah, it's definitely part, I, but I didn't really think about that explicitly, but I'm sure it's been an influence one way or the other, yeah. Yeah. And also sometimes we have a, a movement or something is uh, a giving a, a long a, a gap. So the, uh, I, I imagine the, uh, you are using the Bayesian statistics for animating or something to remove such uh, artifacts. Yes. So the, uh, a, at the same time, the Bayesian statistics takes a very, very huge amount of resources or hardware. Yes. So Well, I think a lot of this will be done in the cloud. It, a lot of it will be done in the cloud. 
cloud-based processing. Um, and in fact, it's all sort of moving that way. Um, of course, we have lag issues w with that currently, so a lot of it's done sort of client side. But um, yeah, I mean, it's something that we worry about. The, the guys in the machine learning group in our building have huge computers they carry around with them. Um, and that continues to be a problem. But I, I think as hardware changes, the capabilities of hardware um, gets uh, more powerful. Um, also, we're, we're learning to do these things faster uh, and with more accuracy and resolution. So, yeah. Okay, I'd like to uh, thank Andy again for a great talk and also uh, as an example of a partnership between different areas of computer science, which I think is the way forward that we're seeing here. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.